Well, I'm the publisher of one of the very few electronics magazines in the world. It's called Silicon Ship. I'm, I'm Colin Mitchell, and I started a magazine called Talking Electronics. Here in Australia, the community was pretty much revolved around the electronics magazines. Electronics Australia, Electronics Today International, Talking Electronics. The magazines were a, a ready source of information. The electronics magazines at the time tended to draw people together of the same interest and report on all the new technology advancing Australia's ability to be right up there with the others in the rest of the world. The magazines were bought by enthusiasts and the radio trade. Look, the magazines are fantastic, they're a wonderful source of information and we have uh, racks and racks of them that, that go back right to the 1930s which are a fantastic source of information. That pretty much was the industry. You bought the magazine, you knew everyone who published in them and there weren't really any community groups in Australia that I was aware of. Not only that, you have the ads from the day and which give you what, what was available and the price and then you have all the picture information and the interviews with people around at the day etc etc which, which is just fantastic. My knowledge of electronics was very largely dependent upon a magazine called Radio and Hobbies. Radio and Hobbies magazine came out with a four page Prices Radio catalogue and this is important because I ended up introducing the first large catalogues in electronics magazines. The main point in starting the magazine was to help people actually learn electronics from the very basic levels. The biggest constraint I had was just even reading about electronics and learning things so that the library system to me was vitally important. Particularly the early years was reading books, magazines. You, you could buy some books. They were very expensive. Very hard to learn radio information, or to, to find relevant radio information, particularly in libraries. Learning about electronics in a country town is ho horror. I mean, it's awful. But instead of studying, I used to spend a great deal of time in a library and used to read all the overseas engineering journals. There was no internet. That was the equivalent of the, of the internet in those days. The university library was just a vast treasure trove of all sorts of stuff on the current technology. Magazines mates there were not the textbooks around electronics was just evolving my parents helped me helped me with uh, uh, buying even at quite a young age five and six and seven little how do things work type books i went to the library and i you know look up the desk and you go hey miss uh, have you got any books on electronics and she goes oh the kids section's over there i'm like I'm looking at it, I don't want to go to the kids section, screw the kids section that's what the crap is you know i want to find out where the electronics books are i used to send away for all the data books i could ended up with a big stack of books. For those that haven't seen them, they are like phone directories and they are the driest reading possible. It's all technical specifications on parts. The information on the chips you had, it was only in what was in your data, it was what was in your library. You'd have data books, stacks of data books. Philips had huge thick books just on transistors alone. The TTL data book was known to all people who designed and built their own computers. This was a thick book of impenetrable technicality which gave you all the information about what you could put in and what you could get out. But I used to sit and read those things. When other kids were reading adventure books and things, I'd be reading data sheets on particular electronic components. Another huge book was just on resistors. It was quite a, quite a lonely business. Um, you, you really didn't have any avenue apart from going down to your local Dick Smith store or reading the electronics magazines. I wish there was more books in public libraries, there was more books. I didn't know that the TAFE system actually had a library. It was the, uh, it may have been a bit of a heyday for electronics, especially analog electronics and radio and so on. It still seemed hard to find, find information out. And you could get photocopied algorithms from it, so that was huge for me. But it was largely reading electronics magazines. I used to read magazines like a sponge. I am largely self-taught. Most people were self-taught. It was by reading the magazines. Reading magazines and doing practical projects. There was no real help except Electronics Australia did produce a, a magazine which I bought each, each month, two and thruppence, and I looked at it and they had some radio circuits in it. I suspect that many of the, of the people who went on to the electronics industry in Australia cut their teeth by building projects out of Electronics Australia. It was worth spending one's pocket money on. My weekends were basically jump on the train, go to Melbourne, stock up on, on magazines and books. I built a few projects out of Electronics Australia. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. Most people go to tech or university. I basically was self-taught. I used to get, in those days, Radio and Hobbies magazine. Now we've moved on from Wireless Weekly and the uh, listener in. Then it was called Radio and Television Hobbies and then it moved to Electronics Australia. And other amateur magazines 
and overseas magazines. Now it's sort of silicon chip. Uh, Radio and Hobbies or Electronics Australia as it became in the 60s. We'll put out a design and they would arrange with various companies to have a kit available and that would have all the appropriate bits in it. Well with my magazine my whole concept was that every project I produced was backed up by a kit. It was pretty easy to build the, these devices because everything was drawn, the, the whole chassis was pictured, each little wire was drawn connected to the valve sockets and things like that. In the books you'd see pictures and so you just try and emulate you know, what you saw in the pictures. And the circuit diagrams, I just uh, did it myself with a, a pen and Indian ink. I used to use a lot of lecture sets. I can remember a series about black and white TV when it first came out and it went for probably 18 months and then there were a whole lot of circuits and people all around the place built their own TV sets. It's a high school with a number of friends who were quite keen on uh, remote control gliders and electronics and we discovered digital computers in the, in the magazines of uh, Electronics Australia and ETI. There was a rich feed of sources to learn from. Talking Electronics. There was a magazine called Talking Electronics and the guy who, who ran it actually I think as far as I know, it was one of the first guys to build a, it was a Z80 CPU and it was a, it was a board, it had a little push button section and he literally went through his magazine every lesson on how to build it, how to program it. It was a simple board, he put little wire links on top to make it work. Quite a number of people have already said that they got into electronics via that tech computer and they're still in electronics now. The magazines were and still are to some degree very important. But if they hadn't got that start with the magazine, they may not have turned around and, and uh, become electronics people. Many of these projects that were put up as in magazines were built by ordinary people. Even though I didn't understand 95% of what was in the magazine, over a period of time through osmosis, I was able to join dots and build up my picture of how stuff worked. They weren't electronic engineers. If you could read, if you could read a diagram, <laughs> If you could use a soldering iron, and in those early days a soldering iron was like a plumber's soldering iron. So it has influenced a lot of people, and that's what I wanted to do, just start people. And once they, once they moved on uh, to, to a higher level, they could go and learn, go to a university, they'd go to a different course. The electronics magazines, of which there is only now one, a magazine called Silicon Chip, which is a very good one. Here in Australia there's only now one surviving electronics magazine, Silicon Chip, that's it. It's our oracle or connection between us all in the electronics industry. We are the only consumer of electronics magazine in Australia and have been for some time. We are also virtually one of three or four in the world, in terms of English-speaking magazines anyway. Anyone in electronics who you talk to about silicon chip or the predecessors of those magazines will say they'd be very sorry to see that they weren't on the market and they try very hard to support them for that very reason.